the Dominion Insurance Test, Great Britain versus France. Now, you might remember that our plans to bring you our very first international game, that was the under-24 match at Oldham a couple of weeks ago, were well and truly wiped out by the snow. However, the good news is that the weather here today is bright and breezy, good rugby playing weather, and the crowd are looking forward to a fantastic game. Well, the winner of our competition for two free tickets to today's game as guest of the Rugby League was Mr. Ralph Bithell. Congratulations, Ralph. Did you expect you to win? No, you never do any of these competitions. No way. <laughs> Were you sure about the answers? Were you quite sure when you put them in? Or was oh, yeah. 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 yeah, there's no doubt about that. Are you, are you a big supporter of the game? Support Wigan, actually. Wigan? Yeah. yeah. How are they doing this season, in your opinion? Not too bad. They can uh, keep on winning the way they have been. They'll, uh, yeah. I think they'll beat the whole anyway. Right. What, a, what about today's game? Any predictions? Oh, Wigan. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Great Britain, you mean? Yeah. 19-5, yeah. I think. 19-5. Not yeah. a bad prediction. Now, of course, it was two tickets, and you brought your wife, Christine, along. Do you support the game as well, Christine? Oh, yes. Yes, I've been going a lot longer than Ralph. Really? Rugby league, yes. Did you convert him? I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's wonderful. Have a wonderful time. I hope you do enjoy today's Thank game. You. Thank you. Thanks so much. The teams enter the playing arena here at the boulevard. The French team first to a round of applause for a good crowd, not the usual boulevard crowd, because, of course, being the Hull fans, they've taken between 2,500 and 3,000 up to Workington with them. But there is the French side, much changed from the side which was beaten 20 points to five in Carcassonne with a lot of changes and a lot indeed of positional changes named only this afternoon. And there's Len Casey. Len Casey leads out the Great Britain side with just one change and that's the man pulling his shorts up, Keith Mumby, a fullback for McBurk. The official party consisting of Lord Derby, the extreme left, he's now dropped back to allow for Neil McFarlane, the Minister of Sport, and the Lord Mayor of Hull, Councillor Harry Woodford, with Louis Bonnery of the French Rugby League, and it's Joel Rusterbrook, the French captain, to introduce his side to the official party. The Minister for Sport now shaking hands, second in the line behind the Lord Mayor, of Hull. It's Bernard, Lafourg, the Great Britain side. The host this afternoon and deferring to the French presentation. There's Neil McFarlane towering over the uh, Lord Mayor of Hull, Councillor Harry Woodford, and Jack Grindrod, Chairman of the Rugby League, joining them. Lord Derby just behind. And there are Dick Gamble and Frank Myler about to introduce their team. Dick Gamble, the manager. Frank Myler, the coach. Big responsibility on these two to take a winning side to Australia next season. Len Casey to introduce his team. Alan Rathbone. Terry Flanagan. Little Andy Gregory, of course. Teammate Tony Myler. The national anthems.
Great Britain making only one change from the team which beat France 25 in Carcassonne. The uh, back injury to Mick Burke means a return for Bradford Northern's Keith Mumby, who was one of the few players to enhance reputations against the Australians. France make changes from the Carcassonne team, some of them positional. The speedy Patrick Solal returns on the wing after being dropped for disciplinary reasons. Giro is paired with Schicitano at half-back, and the pop Chantal and Stora switch positions. And a man Great Britain will watch closely is Joel Rusebrook, loose forward and captain, a very skillful player from the Villeneuve club. France have not won in Britain since the game at Central Park Wigan in 1967. In fact, they've won only three games in England and all of them at Central Park. Today's referee, Don Wilson of New Zealand. Keith Mumby, Casey. They've been bunching a little at the moment. They're going to have to spread out a bit. O'Neill. Gregory, oh, off he goes, the kick through. Bernard and the penalty awarded. The penalty for obstruction against Gregory, although uh, <laughs> if one saw a replay of that, I imagine you wouldn't exactly see Gregory getting out of the way. Andy Gregory winning a penalty. And it's an easily kickable one, unless this win has anything to do with it. side because of Mick Burke's back injury. A lot of people think him unlucky to disappear from the international scene after a very sound second test against the Australians. Great Britain 2, France nil. Noble, Gregory, Casey, O'Neill, Myler. Over the 25. Casey, Gregory. Oh, good pass, Flanagan. Mumby up in the line, Duane. Joe Lydon. Ooh, that was a high tackle. Thumped him to the ground. Joe Lydon crashed to the ground. Good transference of the ball here by uh, the Great Britain side. Uh, Laforgue is up too early there. That's where the gap appears. Well transferred by Terry Flanagan and Keith Mumby up in the line. Duane and Joe Lydon's got the sight of the line. Taking them on the inside and a high tackle from uh, Jack Geig, the fullback there. Quite clearly a penalty. And Geig is going down the touchline. Sinbin, five minutes. wide so still 2-0 Keith Mumby failing with that penalty France reduced to 12 men Jacques Geek the fullback in the sin bin for that high tackle on Leiden Giro restarts underneath it Flanagan Fog pull him down. Casey, Rathbone. Noble is acting half back. Gregory. Oh, that hit uh, Goodway on the head and came back to Gregory. And that's lost possession. Gregory giving it away. Oh, Mike O'Neill will be in trouble. I th uh, Mike O'Neill, I think, will be in trouble there. He took a cloud to Gila Fog. I think O'Neill must really be pulled out on that one. Whatever else happened, his was the first punch. And he's in the sim bin for five. Giro it is, who gives France their first foothold 
around the Great Britain 25. That's the prop forward, Sean Tao, putting the first drive in, attempting to get over the 25. France now over the 25. Hooker McCauley. Bruce Rook, oh, the wing man wasn't there. Bruce Rook firing that out to Patrick Solal, who just wasn't up for it. I think Bruce Rook a bit, a bit cross about that. He had some Gallic hard words to say to his teammate. But at least France do have this deep foothold in the 25. Skitchitana going in after that. Well, who has it? Neither of the scrum halves has. And uh, Robin Whitfield is on while play continues. Zero. And an, oh, again off the ball, tackling while play goes on. And Tony Myler leaps on that. But Robin Whitfield has come on with his flag. He obviously saw something, and there certainly were some bouts of hanky panky. Brian Noble being pulled out. So that's probably a penalty, and he's in the sin bin too, my word. Another sin bin five, Brian Noble. So 11 plays 12, and it's a penalty to France. And Schicitano is teeing it up. Schicitano, Carpentras to try to level the scores. He, he is kicking into an awkward swirling wind. Going round the houses. the upright Ronnie Dewayne caught behind the post so Great Britain must drop out I'm looking for Christian Chikitano there the ball just hits the post and Ronnie Dewayne forced to touch down behind his own uh, goal line and the long drop out by Keith Murphy picked up by Didier Benard good elusive little run by the left winger Hero. Front row forward, Storer. Oh, good running, beautifully taken by the centre, Francis Laforgue. But it was a forward pass. And that's France's best move to date. Good bit of handling, but the pass to Francis Laforgue, undoubtedly forward. But France perhaps failing to emerge from an autumn period. They only just got into the game. And uh, one wonders whether Great Britain can possibly win this with Terry Franigan hooking with Brian Noble off. Eight and nine, the white on there. Oh, and the punches are going in. Good way, just centre haymaker. Casey's having a go. In the meantime, Shichi Chano's running away to score a try. There's, there's a free fight going on in the middle. Shichi Chano has touched down. Keith Mumby's trying to pull Shichi Chano's leg off. And it's absolute mayhem. Well, somebody's got to get a grip on this. Really, there are three fights going on everywhere. Mike O'Neill comes back on, Jack Geek comes back on. Robin Whitfield's taking Joel Russellbrook and the two captains are going to have a really severe dressing down from Dole Wilson and told to cool their teams down. And perhaps uh, referee Don Wilson will be quite as kind next time. I imagine the next man to go will go down the tunnel for good. Noble quickly. Flanagan, good way. 
it's Gira the little fellow got him down it's Flanagan Gregory that's a fall pass surely by Milo but no it this could be a try Milo going himself no he ran he's still running but he ran away from his support and with Duane and Leiden on his left there was a try for the taking but it still could be on there's Duane is in Ronnie Duane but he tied it up after Milo Good thinking by Ron, young Ronnie Dewey. There he is, number four, just 19 year old, 10, year, 10 yards from the French line, all the power in the world, resurrecting that position from which we should have scored earlier. A good try, good thinking by young Ronnie there. Ronnie Dewey, who scored 10 tries and 14 goals for Warrington this season. Indeed, last week against Heighton in the Cup, he got three tries and five goals. So a lot of promise there, and a big lad too. And while this is going on, Keith Mumby kicks the goal, France make a substitution. Francis Laforgue has left the field. Serge Dauphin on for Francis Laforgue. France have made a positional switch. Dauphin is normally a fullback, goes to fullback, and there is Francis Lafour being held off with what is obviously an eye injury. That's Leiden. And there is the half-time hooter in what has been a tough, hard, uncompromising first half in this Dominion Insurance Test. Ending with the score. Great Britain, seven. France nil. Join us for the second half. Welcome back. Great Britain kick off through Gregory. For his thoughts on the first half, David Oxley. Well, very disappointing. Scrappy, not a great deal for the fans to enthuse about. Uh, France have had a lot of ball, but uh, the Great Britain tackling has been extremely tough and decisive. So apart from the odd burst from Joel Rue, but nothing's come of it. Our own handling, unfortunately, has not been good either. Uh, when the ball has been moved wide, the French have looked vulnerable, but too many passes have gone astray to produce anything in the way of a score. In fact, too many old scores from Carcassonne have been remembered, I think. Uh, both sides have been looking for each other rather than the ball. Frank Milo will have had uh, a hard word to say at half-time, and the match is definitely there for the taking. We hope for better things this half. Just over the French 25. And great bit moving up very, very fast indeed. To the tackle. That kick is dropping for Mumby. Pouches it. Very secure. Mike O'Neill just over the halfway line. Nobody's acting half back. The Minister of Sport with his daughter, interested spectators. Wasn't allowed to play the ball. Penalty to Great Britain. Joel Rusebrook is uh, giving Herve Giro quite a telling off. Probably telling him that we're seven points down. We're not going to get back into the game giving away penalties. Mumby. Uh, Great Britain still looking for a fluent move. Their only try from Ronnie Duane was a quick piece of individual enterprise. No ball. Casey. Gregory, the short one to O'Neill. And back to Gregory. And a good ball to Flanagan. And a nice one to Smith. What a lovely move. That was rugby. And the try's awarded. 
the French opened up by a really good piece of rugby. Peter Smith. Well, a touch of class at last. Brian Noble acting halfback. Andy Gregory on the run around Ooh. there is... Now, really good work here by prop forward number eight, Mike O'Neill. Slips it back to Andy, this little will of the wisp. Away he goes, number 15, Peter Smith supporting well. And it's uh, Flanagan's pass, beautifully timed. Salal's covering of the uh, tackle, uh, no avail, and under the post for a, a bit of class at last and just what this game surely needs. So just when it looked as if the game was getting bogged down again, Great Britain have done what the crowd and everyone will be seeching them to, open the game up, move the ball quickly instead of dying in the tackle, and Peter Smith brought on as a running forward was there to touch down under the post. Keith Mumby landing the goal. 12 0. Gregory, Myler, Mumby, and he drops the ball. Schicitano, Bernard. The game a little shakers hereabouts. Penalty to France. Flanagan penalised and France about to make another substitution. Jacques Gig is being taken off and Didier Prunac. And this means that France have lost two men injured. Francis Laforgue and now Jacques Gig. They have a penalty. And the kicker will be the man from the second division club, Lario Dominique Balut. It's a long one. 45 to 50 yards. If he kicks this even with the wind, it'll be an excellent kick. What a cracker. What a good kick. Dominique Balou, a late entrant into the French side, and that was a beauty. Beautifully stuck by Dominique Balou, a full 45 yarder that. Straight as a die, straight between the posts, with plenty to spare, a fine kick. Great Britain lead by 12 points to two. Again, he doesn't part with the ball. Smith. Mumby. Casey floating it out. Having to take it, to take it standing still. Both Britain's moves so often lacking cohesion. Gregory Flanagan on the burst, Woodway, almost up to the 25. Noble, straight from acting half-back, Brian Noble, but no one in support to take the pass, but now up come Great Britain in force, Casey selling a dummy, going himself. Eight yards from the French line. Casey Smith to Flanagan, the long one to Gregory, Gregory to Joyner, quickly to Drummond, and the Drummond, who's been yearning for a pass, drops it. French trying to drive out of their own 25. Rusabruk, Schicitano, Giro. Fox, Schicitano, Giro, short ball. Now the chance to wing a Solal. Can he go? Miles after him. Solal still going. Solal might score if he can get past Mombi. He's run well. And it's a good try by Patrick Solal from inside his own half.
Well, we know Patrick Salala of old. He's a class, class winger. And just watch how he twists and turns, keep him on the inside out. Nice little combine play there. And here is the ball now. He's got some space. He's got the legs on Tony Myler turning Keith Mumby this way and that, then taking him on the wide outside with plenty of room to spare. A classical piece of wing play by this very fine winger. Uh, too much for him. The score, Great Britain 12, France 5. A scrum just outside the French, 25. Try now for Great Britain would really stitch it up because France have come into the game in the last 10 minutes with that Salal try. But they've got it, Great Britain. Uh, Gregory, Myler, Joyner. Joyner still going, but again the pass charged down. The handling really has been bad for an international game. Fouquet. Chitano, Baloup. Substitute Prunak. Skitchitano, Giro. Lafor, Baloup, Bernard. And a good tackle. Joyner moving in sharply. Baloup. Skitchitano. Macaulay. Fouquet. Solal. And again inside to Fourquet. And the French reserving their best football of the game for the last quarter of an hour. Schicitano, Macaulay, Giraud, Baloup. Cut. Oh, in tell Gregory, can he go all the way? Oh, his little leg's going. He'll get there. Giraud won't catch him. That finished off the French. Gregory has killed off the French with that interception try just as the French were opening up the game well Andy's not perhaps had one of his better games but watch him step in to take this ball and get those little legs going now this is very brave because he's worked hard for the best part of 80 minutes but he's there to hold off Herve Giraud's uh, attempted tackle and under the post for the try which will surely seal the game for Great Britain and here's Keith Mumby trouble at all Great Britain 17 France 5 Mr. Wilson having difficulty in these late stages certainly has been a fiery game to control the ball Coming out on the Great Britain side, but lost here, Solal. Managing to get the ball out, but... And there is the hooter. At the end of what was, by and large, a disappointing game. Some good moments. But, unfortunately, Great Britain never allowed to play a fluent game. A lot of rough stuff, a lot of hard tackling, and a lot of appalling handling. But at the end of the day, Messrs. Gemmell and Myler, the... Great Britain management team have pulled off another win. Great Britain, 17, France, 5. Well, after the game, referee Don Wilson said, I know some people will blame me for this, but this was the worst game I've ever refereed. And the news of Francis Laforge is that he has a dislocated shoulder. Well, now let's get the views of David Oxley talking to Keith Macklin. There's a saying in the game, Keith, a win's a win, but I think at international level, one is looking and hoping for something rather than better than we got for most of the 80 minutes today. There seem to be too many old scores to settle from Carcassonne a, a fortnight ago. A lot came from our half-backs in that game, uh, but today Andy and, uh, and Tony didn't seem to get it right to me much of the time, and uh, Desbrimen must have wondered uh, whether it was worth turning out at all. Um, there were some pluses. I thought the tackling, uh, as always with this young side, was decisive, and there wasn't... Uh, usually anywhere for the French to go, except when Patrick uh, Solal got away on the outside. But generally, I think, uh, not a performance to relish. A particularly black spot, the handling. The ball seemed to go to us so many times, both sides. 
Yes, I think people were looking for each other, particularly early on, and that didn't help, and the handling never improved from that moment. Not a particularly bad day, a little bit blustery, but uh, usually these boys on both sides uh, seldom drop passes. Today, uh, seldom was, were two passes strung together without something happening. A plus appeared to be the substitution of Rathbone by Peter Smith, because Britain did open up a bit after that. Yes, I thought Peter's experience showed there. He's a very, very good, experienced rugby league forward. Uh, many people think he should have had many more caps than he, he's, he's got. He's still uh, relatively young, but very experienced. And I think he did steady things down, uh, particularly um, in, the, in the midfield there. And the ball began to move a bit more sweetly when he came on, yes. And, of course, in one of the very good moves of the day, he scored a try. Yes, absolutely decisive that. Uh, we were looking a little bit uh, uh, out of sorts, uh, and then he uh, came into that move, finished between the posts, and we stretched that lead, which we were never really going to surrender. And disappointed David Oxley. Well, as you saw, Neil McFarlane, the Minister for Sport, was at that game, joining the largest league crowd of the day. So I took the chance of having a few words with the Minister. Well, Mr McFarlane, some of the play in the first half especially seemed, one could say, almost as rough as a, as a good, vigorous question time in the Commons. Well, I think infinitely worse than a good question time uh, <laughs> in the House of Commons. Yes, it wasn't a very good first quarter, was it? No. I thought it was uh, unfair, actually, to the game of rugby league, because I know that isn't the way that Hull play here. And the last game I saw at Ellen Road last year when I gave Hull the trophy was a scintillating game of rugby, you, uh, rug, rugby league. Where does rugby league fit into the scheme of things, as far as you're concerned, the sports minister? Very important game, uh, absolutely, absolutely magnificent game for this country. And I think that uh, the game came alight for many people with the Australian visitors a few months ago who uh, made certain that uh, we had to go back and start rethinking about our tactics and our style and play. Mm -hmm. They were superb, and they were superb. I think disciplinarians both on and off the field. I met them several times and I saw them on television two or three times. So I think you, just because the game is basically played in the north, although it's played in Cardiff and Fulham a little bit now, mm -hmm. very successfully, the fact is that many people all over the country watch it on television. So as sports minister, could you say here and now that you have plans to help the game in any way? Or? Well, I think when you're talking about plans, there is very much, uh, we try and do all the, give all the help we can uh, to sport in this country through the sports council. But the role of the governing body is all important and so that I would uh, tread very warily when I would make any firm commitment to say that we can do this and we can do that because the game is very, very successful. The thing that I think impresses me so much about it all is the, is the manner of uh, the behaviour of the fans. The spectators are quite superb, although they might have uh, had good cause to feel today that some of the mm -hmm. players on the field yes. weren't behaving too well, and I certainly would endorse that. And in that way, it contrasts with soccer, doesn't it? Well, it does. You see, again, one's got to retain a sense of balance. There were, you know, 99.9% .9 of soccer fans will behave themselves impeccably. The 0.1% the will get in the media and get a lot of interest and attention that way. But last year at Ellen Road, 40,000 people, packed ground, no problems at all, both in the stadium, mm. outside it, or later in the town. Will you come to the boulevard again? Yes, you bet I will. I've got a daughter at university up here, so that I'm uh, added, uh, I have tremendous spurs to come up here. Was she here today? Yes, rather, she's with me today. Yes. Enjoy the game? Yes, very much so, yes, yes. I think it's a, uh, yeah, we always enjoy watching sport, watching, enjoying, watching rugby union, rugby league, football. It's all very enjoyable, and I think the, the fans today quite clearly made their views known. They summed it up just as most people do. They can read the situation effectively, and they booed and shouted they wanted their money back. I was disappointed I didn't see Des Drummond get the ball before the first hour. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Yes, indeed, Minister. Of course, there was a pretty full league programme yesterday. Leaders Leeds went to St Helens and lost 19-7 for their trouble. They still stayed top, but now only two points clear of Hull, who won at Workington. Hull KR, who beat Barrow on Friday night, a third with St Helens in fourth place. At the bottom, Featherstone lost at Warrington, Bradford Northern didn't play, and Halifax beat Carlisle by 14 points to 12. In Division 2, Fulham stay top, but drop a home point in an amazing 25-all draw with Hunslet. So Wakefield, easy winners at Batley, narrow the gap to one point. Salford in third place didn't play, and Whitehaven, who drew at Bramley, are fourth. At the bottom, Dewsbury, Batley and Highton all lost, but Doncaster won. Their 15-12 win over Dewsbury was their first home win since beating Bramley on April the 11th, 1982. Incidentally, new Doncaster coach Clive Sullivan still holds the Hull record of seven tries in one match. That was against, you've guessed it, Doncaster in 1968. Well, after yesterday's games, Bob Eccles of Warrington leads the top try scorers table with 29. Steve Evans of Hull has 23, John Crossley of Fulham 22, and Gary Clark of Hull KR, despite injury, is still there with 19. Steve Diamond of Fulham, who kicked five in that game against Hunslet, still leads the goal scorers with 104. Then there's Steve Hesford of Warrington with 87, and Lee Crooks of Hull also with 87. 
And that brings us almost right up to date.